Hi, welcome to another episode of History Respond. I'm your host, Bob Whitaker. On today's show, we'll be considering Creative Assembly's Total War Shogun 2, a strategy game set in 16th century Japan. Our historical expert for today's show is Dr. John Harney, a professor of Asian history at Center College. We'll be joining Dr. Harney in his own game of Shogun 2. Okay, so here we are in uh, Dr. Harney's game of Shogun 2, produced by Creative Assembly. So, uh, John, thanks for having me in uh, 16th century Japan. Thanks for offering me the chance to be on the show, Bob. It's exciting. <laughs> Yeah, so for us uh, history nerds. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, so what's the what's the backstory of this game? I mean, you know, Creative Assembly they produce games for mm-hmm. Roman history, for medieval history. So, what is it about 16th century Japan that's really um, got them uh, wanting to produce a game? And uh, what's the, what's the historical backstory? Um, well, there's a couple of great questions there. I think to answer the first one. One of the things that, um, or one of the reasons I think this period is so appealing to Westerners actually is partly because it's so appealing to the Japanese and the Sengoku Jidai, as it's called, or the the Warring States period in Japan, or the age of the Warring States, um, has really kind of created a lot of heroes, a lot of kind of heroic scenarios, um, and really the the Sengoku Jidai is the period during which the samurai, in many ways, are at the height of their their power, and and many mm. many centuries later. Um, just before the samurai kind of collapsed and disappeared as a social class, they were still living off the prestige very much and the glory and the supposed um, the supposed kind of uh, privileged role they had in society that in many ways goes back to the reputation that was forged during this period. Um, and there was genuinely a lot of violence, a lot of chances for samurai to, to make themselves living heroes. In addition to that, it was a time during which the political system was virtually absent it wasn't absent but it Mm. was virtually absent and so there genuinely was a huge amount of conflict and there was a rise of uh, groups of people called daimyo Um, and in the game you control you basically pick a daimyo and control him and the daimyos Mm. which literally comes from translations of great and land uh, were these large landholders uh, to whom the samurai owed their loyalty Um, Mm. and they they essentially fought each other for about a century and a half Mm. until finally at the end of the 1500s the great unifiers emerged, you know, Odu Nobunaga, uh, uh, Hideyoshi Toyotomi, and then finally Tokugawa Yasu, these three great men that finally unified Japan concretely in 1600. So I think the game, uh, in terms of why games keep going to this period, it fits nicely, especially in the strategy mechanics, I think, um, because you can basically say to the player here, control a daimyo and fight for Japan, because in kind of a very right. loose way, you're recreating what happened, especially towards the end of the 16th century. Right. So the point of the game is that you're trying to be the unifying force. Your clan is trying to take over uh, the entire island. Is that the idea? Yeah, that, 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 that's essentially the idea. I mean, specifically in, in Shogun 2, it gives you a victory condition of, um, of capturing and holding Kyoto uh, in, in the case. If you pick, it's 1580, I think, for most of the clans. 1585, if you pick one of the really far southwestern clans. Um, and the idea there is that if you capture Kyoto, Kyoto is where the emperor lives, and in essence, uh, I suppose the way of fudging it or making it historically valid is that you then become the shogun, because the relationship Ah. between the shogun and the emperor was one where the emperor was, in theory, um, unassailable in his power, but in practice, utterly reliant on the shogun to rule the country for him. So in essence... And what happened in the end, and would happen again in Japanese history as late as 1868, is that um, one strong person or one group of strong people essentially addressed the emperor and confronted him and could say, I'm going to be the shogun now, so that's the way it's going to be. So right. so this is why they make Kyoto the main, the main goal of the game. I see. So that makes sense. So that would be something you'd say is historically accurate, going after Kyoto then. Yeah, very much so. And I mean, that that is what... Uh, Oda Nobunaga eventually, uh, you know, did, or well, Odo and Oda and the unifiers after him um, gradually did. Um, the emperor, the emperor's role in the political system had been fluctuating for centuries and centuries, and there was a brief attempt just before the outbreak of the Sengoku period in the early 14th century, where uh, the, the Kenmei Restoration, where the emperor tried to reassert his power and was crushed by the Ashikaga shoguns, and that that was kind of it. That was the last gasp of the emperor trying to be hold real power. And if you compare that, for example, to somewhere like China, um, 
or even Korea, where they weren't using the emperor, the word emperor at this time, but had a similar head of state kind of king position. Uh, in those mm. systems, the emperor could actually have control and power. And in the Chinese context, he often did. But in the Japanese mm. context, by the time we get to the setting of the game, the emperor is a figurehead and a figurehead alone. Mm. So you've uh, you've selected a, a clan here to uh, lead and control. This, I suppose, is uh, an avatar of yourself uh, in 16th century Japan that we're seeing here. Uh, you mean an avatar of, of John Harney or just of the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, what we're looking at here uh, is it's it's the clan management page, or it's, it, and it's the Shimazu clan who were a, a, a real clan from the southwest of Japan. This man, Shimazu Yoshihisa, uh, did exist um, as a daimyo early in the Sengoku period. I, uh, beyond that, uh, he never he, he wouldn't rise to the, the profile of the great unifiers. You see here the Mon on either side, the very right. famous, uh, the very famous um, clan symbols, of course. And then in the, uh, in the context of the game here, you see the intersection of what the designers are doing. He has a little mission down here that if I conquer um, Iwami province, I get a little bonus to my, in my economy and what have you. Um, and there's a little diplomacy tab down here. We can see the mon, we can see the emblems of people who I've upset and people that I'm trading with. And then here we have religion, which is actually interesting because Christianity is coming into Japan at this time. And that's something that's actually reflected in the game. Hmm. So where is this uh, where is this clan located on, on the big map? Sure. Well, uh, when you start the game, they're located. I'll, I'll, I'll increase the size here of the map of Japan in the corner. Um, you start here in the very southwest of Japan, and I've expanded a little bit. We're only about an hour and a half or so into a game, and I've expanded to take about half of the island of Kyushu. And the um, way Japanese geography works, uh, you have the main island here of Honshu, with Kyoto as the target here and Kyoto further away then. And Shikoku Island is here and Kyushu Island is here. And one of the cool things actually, Bob, that I like about Shogun 2 um, is that if we can pull back here for a second and kind of go across the map for a moment, one of the things they've done, and of course it's a mechanic for the game, there's specific paths for your armies to go through. And basically the paths are defined by mountain ranges, right? Mm. So, for example, my army can't come from here and just jump over towards this side of Japan because there's a large mountain range in the way. So I've got to go all the way around, you know, to finally follow the road system essentially to fight. Right. Them. Now, that's really interesting because going back in Japanese history for thousands of years, really, I mean, even when Japanese um, society was very slowly beginning to um, to kind of coalesce into something recognizable as a unified, uh, a unified grouping, um, these mountain ranges were important and in fact Japan separates into large plains which have historically even many centuries before samurais existed uh, historically have been the site of, of competition and conquest mm. and mm. back before Japanese emperors existed um, of course later historians would insist the emperors had always existed but um, uh, back when you just had basically you know, tribal chieftains fighting each other they were fighting in between these mountain ranges to a certain extent and that was something that exacerbated conflict then mm. for years to come so and as I say so the Shimazu are here in the southwest in, in, in Kyushu Island and um, so I picked the, the Shimazu for a couple of reasons uh, just to kind of show to, to your viewers here on the YouTube channel um one was just to give myself a little foothold here to have something to talk about in the game. But also Kyushu and Shikoku, uh, this kind of this whole region here, this whole part of the uh, of the country, traditionally was an area that uh, was a site of the income of foreign influence into Japan. Right. Uh, and so, so why I, so why was that? It. I mean why was why was that area I mean, is it just because it's closer to uh, the mainland of Asia or mm -hmm. uh, is it because that it has uh, open ports in that area? Um, it would mainly be basically the geographic proximity to the to the subcontinent would be the main reason. Mm. Um, and in fact, going back even before Europeans come on the scene, uh, when Buddhism first arrives in Japan, it comes through this area. It comes in from China down through the peninsula of Korea and into the southwestern parts of Japan. In fact, going back, the first that we hear about any Japanese society, the earliest sources we have come from the Chinese. Uh, and the Chinese had written histories about the, the people they called the Wa, the W-A, the kings of Wa, who reigned here in the southwest of Japan. Mm. And then later, Japan coalesced kind of over closer to the center of Honshu. Um, but Buddhism comes in, and, and, and local kings and chiefs use Buddhism as a way to 
um, supplement their own authority. And then the Koreans themselves bring all kinds of technologies and um, artisan positions into the country. And so early, you know, current day nationalist Japanese historians wouldn't like to talk about it too much. But the Koreans, funnily enough, had a huge role in the development of kind of Japanese political culture and Japanese right. society. So what we see in the Sengoku Jidai, you know, the Portuguese come over from Goa and in India and, and past the Chinese. This is kind of the first area they come to, but uh, this is by no means the first time you see foreign influence in this part of Japan. Right. So how well are those represents, I mean, are the, how well the uh, relationships between Korea and China, for instance, how well are those depicted in this game? I mean, are they, uh, you know, perhaps uh, trading partners that you can use? Or can they send weapons or supplies to the player character? Mm -hmm. Or is it all just localized within the main island of Japan? It's it's all localized into the into the island chain of Japan. Um, the big um, the big way in which you see interaction with the far with the foreigners, and I'm going to group the Westerners and the Chinese in here together for a moment, would be in the um, in the trading ports that the, they're essentially trading nodes that mm -hmm. we can see here uh, on the map with my fantastic navigation skills. So uh, <laughs> here's one in the south, and this is this is identified by the developers as trade with, with the Indonesian sultanates. Um, going up here, we have another node. This is trade with the Annamese warlords, of course, Vietnamese mm -hmm. warlords there. Um, and up here, we have the Chinese Empire, and further north, the Korean Empire, and uh, or sorry, the Korean Kingdom rather. And it's um, it's 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 very much limited, Bob. I think, I mean, understandably, by what they're trying to do in terms of creating a game. This is essentially this is the extent to which you see a lot of interaction, certainly with the Chinese and the Koreans. So basically. Right. Um, at least in the vanilla version of the game, I couldn't really speak just yet to the to the to the to the DLC and the add-ons. And basically, you can capture one of these nodes here, and that establishes income for you within the within the uh, game I mechanic. Um, one area where you do see a big intersection between Japan and the outside world is in the kind of the mechanic surrounding religion. So, for example, in my in my area here, I chose to um, in my little area here, my little kind of uh, village in my home province, I decided to establish uh, a Nanban trade port. And Nanban is a Japanese word that literally means southern barbarians. And this was the term. <laughs> Sounds uh, like European. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. And and basically, they, it was just because people, of course, were coming from the south. And so Nanban was the word that was used. And the Nanban port, in the context of the game, basically, it's kind of a risk reward type thing where you'll make more money out of it but local people will become more upset because there's this con there's this mechanic of um, Christianity will spread in your home territory. And in fact, you have the option oh. playing the game for your clan to embrace Christianity and go with it. And then, then so the does risk that, reward shifts. Does that, come any, does that come with any particular uh, risk reward with Christianity, for instance? I mean, does it help your soldiers in battle or does it help you hold on to your territory? What are the, what are the results of taking on a new religion? Well, in terms of the bonus of taking on Christianity within the game, I think um, it ties into uh, the broader kind of trade income that comes in. But the risk then that if you if you take on Christianity and more of your people adopt Christianity, the dual risks are um, rebellion or upset from people within territories who who don't want to don't want to take on this foreign faith, and then other uh, non-Christian um, daimyo will look quite poorly upon you. So negotiating with them would be quite difficult. Mm. Uh, and, and, and in the game, um, although the game is a total war game, of course, you know, diplomacy is a pretty big part of it. And so you see here that I have various interactions with all these different clans. Uh, the Miyoshi are indifferent to me. The, uh, the Ochi really don't like me at all. The Sago, the Sagara hate me. Um, but the idea being that um, if you were a Christian, many of them would turn much more hostile against mm. you. Mm. Although um, one of the clans in the game, in this particular game, I mean, um, I think it was the Shoni, but I can't, I can't quite recall now, have already made the decision to convert to Christianity. So even in the context of this game, and a couple of hours in, um, the AI is having its clans do things do things like that, which is quite interesting because that was a big thing in Japanese history the, the, right. at this time. This this was the time, like the mid-1500s is the time where the Christians show up and really start to, to shake things up, especially in the southwest of Japan. Right. Let's uh, let's jump into your game here. See what uh, see what you're up to. I mean, uh, do you have a plan so far sure. with uh, how you're gonna try to take over the island? Well, you know, I had a plan. 
And uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is where I'm glad that, um, you know, after your first video, many con commenters said they wanted more history. And that's good because I'm not good at this game. I enjoy playing it. <laughs> uh, and so what I was doing, uh, you know, setting up in anticipation of our conversation, my idea, I was going to try and solidify this island as much as possible, the island of Kyushu. And once I had a foothold, that would put me in a nice position to start moving further eastwards. And um, I've set the game on easy just to kind of make it easier to talk over if we're going to do any kind of encounter or anything like that. Sure. But um, my idea at the time, the neighbor that was here was initially conquered, and I very much wanted to vassalize half this island if possible, just to make my own life easier. Um, and of course, this is something, this again is central to what you know the feudal society of Japan Whenever I teach about Japan, I always tell my students feudal should be in quotation marks because it's not the exact same as the European feudal situation, but you have this kind of vassal type allegiance situation. Right. So I was ho essentially hoping to subcontract uh, my problems out to my vassals. <laughs> they wouldn't do it. And so uh, just before this uh, video starts, I have tried and miserably failed to take out the castle town here uh -huh. of, uh, of Kunimoto. And in fact, I see you see all kinds of things are happening here. I have a ninja who I don't really know what to do with. So the ninja was trying to get in and assassinate a general. He's been uh, confronted by a Metsuke. Uh, and Metsuke is kind of, in the game, is somebody who can locate ninjas and uncover spies and, 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 and intimidate um, the locals. And so we have here in the game two agents confronting each other. We have an army here sitting here right. who's suffering attrition because he's away from home in the winter. And so a lot of things happening. Not many of them good, I must confess, <laughs> in terms of what I'm uh, terms well, of what I'm trying to do with the game. Well, so you've you've brought up the ninja there. I mean, how common sure. were ninjas during uh, 16th century Japan? Uh, and for that matter, you know, how common were other you know, popular agents in uh, uh, Japanese history, uh, such as the geisha, how, how common were they actually used or utilized by uh, samurai during this period? You know, that, that's a great question. Um, of the kind of, and again, looking at the base game here, if we look at the agents, in fact, I can bring up the agents while we talk. The, um, the ninja are probably among the most historically accurate of the agents portrayed. Mm. So here we have the ninja, the monk, the missionary, the metsuke, the Iko monk, and the geisha. The Iko, Iko Iki are around at this time. They're extremely radical um, Buddhist group. Um, they are one of the more famous kind of warrior monk factions. You know, the Japanese have warrior monks again going back a long time. Sure. This this ties into one of the uh, one of the DLCs for the game actually. But uh, during the events covered by the famous Japanese classic tale of the Heike, um, Taira Nakiyamori burns down. Um, one of the great, he burns down the temple at Nara, uh, in, in, basically in an attempt to try and shut down the political power and obstructionism of Buddhist monks. And so at huh. this time, the Sengoku period, the monks are uh, very difficult. And so in the context of the game here, the Iko monk, uh, basically when you, in the game, when you, when you hire him, as it were, he's going to go around and basically royal people up. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, and you see he's kind of, he, he and the missionary kind of form a very kind of similar um, similar roles right. in that sense. Huh. Now, the ninja is, as I said, one of the more accurate agents because the ninja are really the shinobi, which you know is a term I think familiar with lots of at least video game players of our age. Bob, of uh, the shinobi, <laughs> the shinobi begin to emerge around this time largely because uh, they're needed. You know, largely because historically, you know, because of the the nature of conflict at the time. You need um, someone to uh, assassinate people for you and, and, and steal things and commit sabotage. And so the shinobi emerge and kind of gradually evolve into what we know as the ninja. Mm. And so in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's really quite good. Mm. Now, where once again we're seeing a little bit of crossover here, um, a little bit of bleed over in the Tokugawa period that follows, would particularly be with the two agents here, the Metsuke and the Geisha. Right. So I just mentioned the Metsuke just now. Again, in the context of the game, um, he's someone that you can use to, as you can see here, he bribes enemy garrisons, he bribes enemy generals, he detects ninja and other agents. Um, he's essentially a secret policeman, and, and that's a pretty good description of what the Metsuke was. The problem is they're not very common. In fact, I don't know if I'd be comfortable using the term as early as the 1550s, 1560s kind wow. of period. Okay. Um, the Metsuke... Uh, were very much kind of figures that emerged in the early 17th century. And 
That's kind of a big difference because the early 17th century is much more stable politically. And so the Metzke, they are kind of secret policemen, but, you know, they operate and, and they really kind of exercise what today we would consider to be almost terror tactics on behalf of the government. They, they, they do these things on behalf of their daimyo, but the daimyo are operating within a different context where there's not a lot of competition with other daimyo, but there is a need to pacify normal people mm. you know um but again you know uh, i think the developers like i say i really do feel they they make a big effort to to get in with the spirit of the game here and it's you know it's 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 pushing things a little bit in terms of the chronology but it's a nice unit for them to have in the game sure and then finally uh of the agents i talk about the geisha for just a moment in the game they're assassins which you know is completely one of the most egregious things in the game, historically, <laughs> um, it's just not something the geisha would do. Um, however, they kind of distract male generals and things like that. They can be used in the game to do that, and that would be accurate. But again, uh, the geisha uh, don't really quite exist in the 1500s. Um, they really, again, they emerged in the Tokugawa period. Right. And interestingly enough... That is in the context of um, a lot of urbanization and a complete change of culture in the Tokugawa period. So what's happening during the period covered by the game, you have these castle towns which are very important to the game. You know, you basically capture a castle town, it means you've captured the province. You can then upgrade your castle town as you see fit. Um, during Jap During this period of history in Japan, what's actually happening is the samurai are gradually transitioning from being independent, living off the land, having their own territory they return to in between battles, to being given stipends by the daimyo and operating out of these castles. Mm. And so in the early 1600s, these castles become, these castle towns become cities because when the samurai go in there and take their money with them, um, merchants follow, artists follow, and that's when the geisha emerge because right. there's actually an urban culture and you'll go to a sake den and you'll go gambling and you'll visit with a geisha um, and that's when, so, we're, you know, the developers have had a little bit of bleeding in here um, of what the samurai were like in the 1500s versus what they were like in the 1600s. Right, I see. Um, which, again, is understandable, but but just to point it out, that it's a little bit it's a little bit anachronistic there. Right. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for pointing out that. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's jump into a battle here, if we can. I mean, if uh, sure, we've got if an my, opportunity if... to perhaps win sure. one, you know, that might impress the crowd, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to get some serious grief here uh, from people because what's happened is I've scuppered my own economy uh, to the point where um, basically what we'll do is we'll try and get a battle started. Okay. Um, even though in reality, uh, in the context of the game, it will destroy me because economically my guys will be ruined. <laughs> we'll get him out here. You see, you see him here. I have a general figure. He's wearing this very famous horned horned helmet, very common. In this period, in, in and we'll talk about that now in a second, because when we look at the battle, we'll have a chance to look at what these guys look like. Sure. He has Yari Samurai with him, and then a bunch of Ashigaru archers and um, kind of spearmen, the Yari Ashigaru with the Yari weapon here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our viewers, I'm sure, will know, because a lot of video game fans are, tend to be quite into Japanese history. Um, this is the only samurai unit in this particular army, and that's a decision I made, because they're expensive. Um, but it also kind of... it. it luckily for me, reflects, to a certain extent, composition of armies, and that the samurai were the elite force, not really an officer class, as we understand in the modern context, of course, but um, very much kind of an elite fighting force, better trained. But shock the Ashigaru troops. here, right. in, in many ways, they could be shock troops, yeah, and, and they tended to be, I, we get into this like in, a, in a few minutes, maybe, there was a whole, you know, there's a whole ideology that comes with being a samurai, or certainly that emerges in the next hundred years or so. And then the Ashigaru are... They're non-samurai troops, but they're conscripts. So they're they're not peasants dragged up ad hoc. They are people who've been conscripted to fight for a reasonably well-organized force. They've been given decent armor. They've been given decent weaponry. I see. So I, I I'll take the the turn here, and it'll switch through the seasons, which is a really cool thing they do with the map. It just makes the again. I think that the the map here has been very lovingly created by the uh, artists working mm. on the game. Okay, so here we are. So the Sagara actually want an honorable peace, but um, for the purposes of our video, I'm going to ignore that and fight them anyway. <laughs> um, but, but let's just for a second here, um, let's make a counter offer or see what the options are for a counter offer. Sure. So you see that we could request a trade agreement. I don't know why I'd throw that in there, but this is an option the game gives you. Um, I could make him my vassal. 
which he may or may not go for. It's hard to know. I could arrange a marriage um, where I demand a wife from his clan to marry one of my sons, or I could offer a daughter to his. Um, or we could exchange hostages, which you know is something you see a lot in other areas historically, of course, Bob, as you know. Absolutely. Um, and it, this becomes a huge element of Japanese society after 1600, because the man who does win this all in the end, Tokugawa Yasu, he creates a system called alternate attendance. And what he does is he sets up shop. So I'll say no to this gentleman. <laughs> what Tokugawa Yasu does is he sets up shop uh, in Edo, which today we know as Tokyo, Tokyo, of course. Yeah. So that's why they call it the Edo period, 1600 to 1868. And what he says to them, uh, his daimyo all across the country, is they have to come and see him uh, for a year at a time. So you see the Metsuke yet again. My ninja has nine lives, it seems. He just can't get him. As I as I as I warned you, I'm mounting on rest here. Um, the way the game the, the the way the game does this mechanic is um, that you you know you get repression points essentially. So because I've taken too many troops away from Bungo, Bungo's about to go nuclear, and that's that's my own fault. That's fine. Um, here's an interesting thing: urban migration. The uncertainty of the harvest, increasing profitability of the life of the artisan is driving people away from the land and into the towns. So again, this is something, Bob, we see happen um, an awful lot a century later right. during the Tokugawa period. Right. Uh, but, so it is something that happens in Japanese history. It doesn't quite happen during this particular period per se. I mean, it's certainly so a starting. Bit of, bit, a bit of fudging by creative assembly here. A little bit of fudging. A little bit of fudging. But again... Um, it's the kind of thing where one could argue, well, it is happening, uh, maybe not as much, but uh, as the game implies. But it, it's kind of slowly starting. So um, what we'll do is, I believe in the free market. I will encourage the migration. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, but to finish by saying about uh, Tokugawa Yasu, uh, he establishes base in Edo, and all the daimyo from around the country, he actually organized them into uh, according to the loyalty. So the Shimazu ended up becoming a Tozama clan which meant that he didn't trust them very much so they were kicked out to the fringes or left out in the fringes um, but every daimyo had to go and spend a year in uh, in Edo and then go home and spend a year at home and what the, the way that it worked and this is why I'm bringing up the hostages is that when you went back to your own domain your, your immediate family, your wife and your children stayed with the shogun mm. and stayed in this very expensive residence that you were expected to maintain whilst you also maintained an expensive residence back in your own domain. Mm. And it put you under massive economic pressure, but it was also a hostage system. Right. So if you upset him, uh, he'd kill your wife. And of course, these people care about their wives and so on sure. a lot more than they do about the average Japanese person, uh, for example. Very very similar to uh, medieval European history, for sure. Yeah, and this, you know, and this is why you know, I mentioned the word feudal in quotes. I mean, part of the reason Japanese history... <laughs> Uh, has been popular in the West for uh, well, quite a while now, is that from very early on, Western historians and, and Western missionaries and Western businessmen, business people, have been going to Japan and they've been seeing these similarities uh, between uh, between the between the cultures. So it's really, really quite interesting. So, okay, I'll get rid of these things. So so here you see, so I'm trying to get my gentlemen together here and we'll, we'll make another mount on Hizen, uh, at which point I won't even try and do anything tactically interesting. We'll just kind of look at some of the graphics. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, so actually, very quickly here, what we can do, if we go to this town where people are upset with me, so you can see the mechanic there, uh, and you can see here, Bob, you see non-clan religion is part of the problem here, mm. you see. So this is how the game is trying to reflect, you know, genuine religious tension that is there. You know, the Christians were quite successful. It was the Jesuits that were in Japan at this time, um, and the Jesuits were very very practical in how they wanted to spread the religion and so you know and they would follow the same tack in china as well where they would try and approach senior leaders and convert the leaders right and part of the advance and it was relatively successful by some estimates um there may have been as many as a quarter of, quarter of a million catholics in japan wow uh, by the by the end of the 16th century um which might be a little bit optimistic on the christian side but is not completely you know out completely of nuts by any by any right. stretch. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Let's just see if I can desperately stop that from happening. Oh, so you see here now I can have a Metsuke because I have a market, so I could hire my own agent there. And so we'll just we'll let's zoom out a little bit actually and let's see this lovely map here and let it change again.
They have a couple of cool factions here as well, Bob. If you look at the mon up at the top switching, you see um, right at the end they have the foreign traders and they have the Portuguese shield there. And they also mentioned the, the Waco pirates, W-A-K-O. Ah. And these were pirates that were notorious across the entire region. Oh, look at this. You see? It's happened to me. Oh, there we go. A, a Christian revolt. So perhaps I should I should turn to Christianity. Those damn Jesuits. Yeah. yeah, so you see this area. Yeah, the Jesuits were there before I got there and they've made my life difficult. Just, ah, desperate. You know, it, later on when the Jesuits were expelled, they moved their uh, they moved their project on to China. And funnily enough, what happened was they got into a big dispute with the Chinese in the early 18th century, partly because different Catholic orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Jesuits, began to argue with each other over how best to convert these strange Eastern pagans. And and one thing the Jesuits were quite okay with doing, the Jesuits were fine with letting Catholic converts continue to do some ancestor worship in fact they even they learned the local language and they would talk to local intellectuals and try and argue that christ was in some ways a confucian style figure other catholics that were more conservative couldn't go along with this and in the end that that re results later in further further disparity between the two mm. cultures so yeah so here we are so let's let's get a fight started let's see if i can get this gentleman to join my army so now that army looks reasonably okay and let's go in here and take uh what's in so we have here this information, 1467 versus 621, so I should actually beat this guy. Uh, <laughs> I have the option to continue the siege and so on. Don't jinx but yourself. Wait, uh, exactly. And up here, my, my, my tutorial person, she's telling me about quelling rebellions and so on. But we can ignore her for now. I'll we'll start this. Something I should say as well, Bob, actually, uh, the artwork is really lovely in these little cutscenes, in these little interstitials as well. You see, even the face of this horse here, um, that's a very classic kind of Edo style, Edo period being 1600, 1868. Right. A classic style of the paintings that became hugely mm. popular in Japan over the next couple of centuries. And these paintings celebrated celebrated battles that happened during the Sengoku Jidai. You know, this was this would this period that that, that Total War uh, Shogun Two looks at. This period goes on to be celebrated for centuries and centuries in Japanese Japanese culture and even today in Japanese popular culture manga, anime and various uh, various types of popular media you'll see these themes come up again and again and I just like there's a little bit of authenticity there this looks like a classic kind of a screen painting from the 17th century which I, th which I think is cool it's a nice little thing Yay! so start the deployment and go into the cutscene here And again, this is obviously kind of an abstract representation, Bob. There's not a lot happening. But as I said, this is prior to them becoming real cities, as it were. Mm -hmm. A little bit later. Right. It looks like, he was, looks like he was pretty convincing. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it. They do quite a good job with these speeches. You see here he's talking about our foes must make the stand or history will not remember them. Perhaps one day a poet will compose a sad line. Um, again, a little bit of bleed over, but in this case, Creative Assembly um, aren't guilt. They're not guilty of anything that other people haven't been doing for a very, very long time. So, for example... I've been teaching a class on the Age of the Samurai um, at Central College for the last, uh, the last, this semester just gone. And one of the things we've looked at is how this kind of myth of the samurai was developed, especially in the 1600s and 1700s. So at this time, Bob, you know, samurai were pretty rough and ready type guys. You know, these are guys who fight and murder for a living. Um, they'll betray each other at the drop of a hat, uh, or well, at least they'll betray each other if it's to their advantage. Later on in Japanese history, um, there's lots of focus on. Um, kind of the cultured nature of the samurai and the importance of loyalty to the right. samurai and the notion that the samurai's first job is to die uh, for his overlord and things like this. So the creative assembly are reflecting the kind of the romanticized version of the samurai, but I wouldn't actually give them any kind of guilt there because in truth, that's something that's been happening for um, quite a long time Sure. Uh, in, in representations of them. Even in Japanese culture, right? Oh yeah, very much so, very much so. And in fact, you know, uh, we, were, my students and I, were sharing uh, the code of the samurai this semester and reading it together. I'm just gonna. It's tough to talk about history and do this at the same time. So, <laughs> for those watching who know how to play this game, prepare to be horrified. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, for the sake of just getting things moving while we talk, 
you know, and the Code of the Samurai was a book, a pamphlet produced in the in the late 17th century that talked about things like that, like, you know, to be a good samurai, you must be willing to die for your lord, you must take care of your swords and your armor, etc., etc. But already the samurai were transitioning in an age of prolonged peace into administrators and also to people who hung out with geishas and drank wine and, you know, by, by, the, by the mid to late 1800s, Fukuzawa Yokichi, who's a very famous Japanese intellectual from the period, who was born as a samurai, he writes in his autobiography, he talks about fellow samurai at the age of 19 or 20 selling their swords for money to go gambling. Right. And the, the two swords in particular for the samurai were a great symbol of their prestige. Mm. Um, so part of the reason these pamphlets and stuff are being um, shared around is to desperately try and continue some form of education in the, in the heart of the samurai group because at this time the Sengoku Jidai they're transitioning into becoming a hereditary group but they're not one just yet in the 1600s and 1700s they're, hered- they're hereditary group so you're guaranteed a certain amount of prestige because of who your father was and the connection with this battle is gone so what we're seeing here in the video game, what you see a lot of in Japanese culture also, is kind of glossing over the, the divides there between the two and marrying the best of both worlds. And so bringing right. us the cultured, the cultured prestige of the later samurai, but also the viciousness and the success of the, uh, of the earlier ones. Right. So again, I don't know what these gentlemen are going to do. But if, we, if, we, if we zoom in here as well, Bob, you see the, uh, the sashimono. You see these uh, these famous kind of little banners on each guy's back, you see? Yes. Um, this is, again, this is a nice little touch. This is very much what soldiers looked like at the time in Japan. And in fact, samurai would have even more elegant sashimono. And this goes back even to the 12th century. And you'd have um, samurai who would ha- uh, wear the skulls of their enemies on top of a pole or on top of it. So instead of having some kind of fabric or flag, right. they would have a human skull oh, there. Oh, goodness. Because... Yeah, well, because beheading was a big thing for the samurai, you see. Um, because that was just the traditional way that you vanquished your enemy. You took the head of your enemy. In fact, Saigo Takamori, the, some, some people call him the last samurai, when he died in 1877, there was a huge kerfuffle because his head couldn't be found at one point. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they ended up having to mythologize where his head was because one account we have from a foreigner that was present is that they came in and his body, his beheaded body, was lying on the ground naked uh. and the head was right there. And for the Japanese, that wasn't enough. There had to be kind of a, a romanticization, a story sure. about the head. Sure. Well, so what were, these, what were these fabrics for? Were they to help identify soldiers on the battlefield to each other or were they... Did these uh, fabrics, they have particular symbols that had a religious significance? What was the purpose of those? Um, it was almost exclusively for identification of the battlefield. Um, and so, especially for the Ashigaru, the non-samurai type troops, really it was just a case um, of just basically being to be identified and to be seen by your own samurai. Okay, these are my guys. Um, as you can see here, if you guys remember from a few moments ago, that's the same Mon right there. Right. Um, obviously, the archery symbol is a video game thing, of course. But uh, this is the Mon there showing that these are Shimazu troops. Right. My enemy have the, the Sagara Mon there on their own. Um, for the samurai themselves, Bob, though, it could have an extra level of pageantry to it. And when the samurai first emerged in the 12th century, the sashimono were actually a big deal uh, because the sashimono were kind of, um, in a way, were how they distinguished themselves from other warriors, as it were. And so particularly um, during the period, the Genpei War, which is actually a DLC offered by the game, um, and, and subject, as I said, of Terra the Heike, one of the famous Japanese classics, uh, samurai lords would adopt certain kind of colors and certain designs in order so that people on the battlefield could recognize each other. And it's not as prominent during the Sengoku period, but certainly early on, early on when the samurai first emerged, it was very important to identify your enemies as well because dying was not necessarily shameful, but being killed by some kind of low, low-ranking courtier or like a teenage boy or something right. could be very, very embarrassing indeed. Whereas... Um, you can see it's easy difficulty because a small cavalry unit has, for some reason, <laughs> suicided themselves there. Um, uh, but um, and, and, and early on, the samurai would actually pair off before battles. Like they would line up and go, right, you know, I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the lord, so uh, I should fight their lord or their second in command. And they would actually make sure that people fought against somebody that if they lost and if they died, they would at least have an honorable death. Well, that, that um, sounds very similar to European history because uh, it was always a big, uh, a big change in uh, medieval history when uh, crossbows and uh, gunpowder weapons uh, were introduced because it allowed you know, a lowly commoner to kill 
a great lord or a knight on the battlefield, right, which right, was right. incredibly, uh, you know, one of the worst things that could happen to a lord. Uh, and it, you yeah. know, it really changed the dynamics of feudal society, not just on the battlefield, but in terms of economics, uh, and then also society. I mean, that's fascinating because, you know, there's definitely a similar thing in Japan. And, you know, the tale of the Heike, which the tale of the Heike evolved as an oral tale, which, you know, again, has become one of the great classics of Japanese culture, I suppose, because it, 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 now you can buy it as a book, of course, but traditionally it should be recited in public. Um, something that people actively thought about and referenced, and the tale of the Heike is full of encounters between men that are about to kill each other. And mm-hmm. you know, one of the most famous passages in the tale is the death of Atsumori, where um, an experienced warrior um, is, is weeping with regret at taking the life of such a young man that has so much ahead of him, and all this kind of thing. You know, so you're right. So the, the, the arrival of the muskets in the Japanese scene it definitely makes things a lot more crude, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. Like, I mean, in, in Tale of the Heike, one of the most famous suicides, in the, and there are many suicides in the tale, um, is a great warrior who actually jumps off his horse, uh, holding his sword in such a way that when he hits the ground, his, he impales himself through his own throat. Um, and this is seen as this is seen as a fantastic way to go, you know. So, <laughs> so, so, so being shot or, or heaven forbid, dying through some freak accident, would have been horrific for a samurai, for a horrific thing for a samurai to go through. So you're sieging a, a fort here. I mean, how right. how common were siege weapons, uh, for instance, during this time period? I mean, would the Japanese build them beforehand, or would they build them mm-hmm. on the battlefield? Would they use them at all, or would they simply have their soldiers try My to storm Lord, up sure. the hill? Well, that, that's actually something, you know, Bob, that in the historiography in the last um, few decades, a lot more credence is being given now to the presence of siege weaponry, because it was something that people didn't talk about an awful lot, historians didn't focus on, um, but we now know that there was a certain amount of siege weaponry involved, and generally speaking, um, it wasn't the ad hoc building the battlefield type stuff, it tended to be, um, especially as the era went on, it was more likely to be kind of manufactured uh, type weaponry, particularly... Mm. Um, because arquebuses, of course, were not the only type of firearms that came in. Cannon came in from the Europeans also. Uh, and so the, you know, the Japanese daimyo that could afford the cannon really made great use of it. And so, of course, you know, in the game, they balance this a little bit by having kind of mer- you know, trading opportunities on the western side of the map because it reflects the historical reality. Um, but they are going to have to address that in balance in some way because the way it worked out in history was that you know, Oda came from the south-central west of the country, um, his successors came from similar parts of the country basically being in a position to purchase cannon and then produce their own cannon using western technology was a huge huge advantage mm. for them. huge advantage in the period so how are your shoulders doing up there it looks like you've got one set of men up there and then yeah i i i, I, the, I, rest I, are, I the rest are kind of chilling out yeah, I kind of distracted myself here. Uh, <laughs> talking to you, so, I noticed. You know, uh, but like again, this is the beauty of um, one of the things I learned watching uh, uh, Quick Looks on Giant Bomb a long time ago is that uh, even people who do this for a living have trouble playing and talking. So I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Um, I'm just gradually going to slowly, uh, slowly defeat them uh, <laughs> over time. So in fact, let's 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 speed this up and hope that. Uh, something happens. I've got a lot of archers kind of firing at them. So, um, and again, little bits here, little bits of architecture, um, you know, fairly representative of the time. Um, You know, Japanese architecture and and Japanese cities in general were an interesting fusion of Japanese individuality, but also, or Japanese distinctiveness, I should say, but also huge Chinese influence uh, going back for many, many centuries. Um, And, but at this, at this period, we kind of covered this a bit earlier, not a lot of interaction between the Chinese and the Japanese, the, the, but the Chinese still offer that kind of cultural foundation, right? For them. So now we've got we've got your general, we've got your samurai, but uh, we've got all these archers here. And so what what's the background for these guys? What are what are common people uh, making uh, of themselves during this time sure. period that we you know associate with these samurai? Who the samurai are you know maybe elites or close to being elites? Sure. What what's the life like for a common soldier in these armies? Um. Well. If you were a conscript, it wasn't necessarily all that bad. Um, it kind of was was better than nothing. Uh, the you know one of the problems, of course, we have is as you as you know yourself, Bob, is the further back we go, the less interested, especially historians in, for example, the early to mid twentieth century, they weren't that interested in trying to figure out what was going on with the common people. In fairness to them, there's a certain problem, of course, with a lack of sources, I suppose, as well. 
Um, but we know that uh, life was extremely volatile for Japanese people at this time. Um, the, the phrase often used in Japanese history is Gekko Kujo, which translates literally as bottom conquers, conquers above. Um, mm-hmm. It's upheaval from below. Um, and so this was a time where, you know, you are prone to, you know, being caught in the middle of these conflicts have little to do with you. So if you're going to get caught in the middle, being caught in the middle as a conscript might actually be, might actually be a better off situation for you. Because the daimyo um, assigned value to having troops that actually were well disciplined and could fight, you know, you'd be well fed, you'd be reasonably well taken care of. Um, but, you know, Japanese society was in massive, massive upheaval at the time. I mean, there were... Christianity was impacting society, as we've kind of mentioned already. Um, but also, you know, some of these Buddhist sects became very, very radical indeed. And so a lot of men in particular kind of, you know, left villages and towns and joined with um, radical Buddhist sects or maybe became Christians or, or something like that, you know. Um, so... To answer your question, kind of just in the very general sense, the average person, like all, frankly, like all periods of Japanese history up to this point, um, being a regular person, you know, <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. But if you know, you know, you're you're kind of you're kind of winning or losing the lottery at birth, almost. Mm-hmm. You know, and and Japanese society was extremely hierarchical, um, and 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 was aligned to the four uh, divisions. Um, with the kind of samurai slash nobility at the top, the farmers would be um, would be second after that, um, with the merchants at the very bottom of the four ranks, which is comes from their Chinese uh, cultural heritage. Although interestingly, in China, the farmer was ostensibly at the very top of the four, uh, of the of the ranking system. Mm. The Japanese tweaked that a bit to give samurai and daimyo, essentially political rulers, slightly more respect within the ideology of, of the. Uh, of the country and of course merchants were completely resented by everybody um, because in a traditional Confucian society uh, merchants don't have value they don't add anything to society Confucian ideology traditionally values education it values moral behavior and merchants were seen as inherently immoral because they handed money handled money and that was dirty mm-hmm. and all they really did was they bought something from a farmer and sold it to a samurai and they're not doing anything they're just profiting mm-hmm. and so they were looked down upon but this is also a time partly thanks to the Gekko Kujo of which I spoke, where um, merchants are slowly growing. And in fact, merchants will grow over the next couple of centuries and become hugely important in Japanese society. So it, it, it's really an interesting time. And in fact, this would continue after the end of the Sengoku period, where you have suffering alongside prosperity and you have stagnation um, co- you know, coexisting with advances technologically and advances in the Japanese commercial system. Hmm. Okay, well, decisive victory for John here. Uh, we got some imperial recognition, I guess, as well, so congratulations. Yeah, indeed, and before, actually, one last thing I should say, um, in the mechanic of the game, once you get enough fame, uh, the shogun will get, every, the emperor will ask everyone else to fight you, um, which is a l- fudging things again a little bit, um, but again, ties into what we call this dual governance system, uh, where the emperor was a figurehead and the shogun, his military right-hand man, but the assent of the emperor, the um, the consent of the emperor to do anything was vital, vital to your political mm. legitimacy. Well, I think that uh, wraps things up for us here at uh, History Respond. Uh, thanks again to our historical expert, Dr. John Harney, for joining us today. And uh, please tune back in uh, in the following weeks for new episodes. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Really, really happy to do it.